Today we'll be talking about chapter two of Freud's The Future of an Illusion. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome to the channel where we talk about psychiatry and religion with a focus on how to apply it to your life. Today we'll be talking about chapter two of Freud's The Future of an Illusion. Last time we talked about chapter one, so do check that out if you'd like to know, because it's going to build upon things and it's going to get more complicated as you go on. There are a total of 10 chapters, so you want to kind of want to start from the beginning. I'll do a little summary of chapter one. In chapter one, we talked about, uh, he talked about culture and he defined culture as the things that people do to, uh, ben to change nature, to receive benefits from it, like farming or uh, I guess raising cattle and then you receive benefits and then how to distribute those benefits to the rest of society. He then talks about two aspects of human nature, which is the first one is that human nature is lazy. And the second one is that human nature, they don't listen to reason. So as a result of those two aspects of human nature, you need to coerce people in order to do labor for culture to change nature and then get benefits from uh, society. So that's a really quick, skinny um, uh, wrap up of uh, chapter one. Chapter two talks about Freud and uh, he's talking about why do, how is it that society can exist when people are unhappy? He's, he's, he gives, uh, he's kind of looking at, let's say, a society that has a lot of slaves, right? Uh, the majority of the people are slaves and they're generally suppressed uh, compared to the aristocrats who get all the good stuff of, let's say, owning land and things like that. How is it that society can allow uh, a group of people uh, to be unhappy and, and still function? He says the answer is uh, related to the, uh, something has to do with the psychology of some sort and he kind of elaborates on that. He talks about uh, this idea that People, by and large, are going to be deprived of what they want to do. And there are different types of, you know, deprivations. Uh, some deprivations are kind of universal to everybody, and some deprivations are specific to specific classes only. So a good example is that cannibalism. We're deprived, generally speaking, people are deprived from, you know, eating other people. We don't want to eat other people, or we, we kind of have a sense we shouldn't eat other people. That would be a, a, a universal uh, deprivation versus, let's say, um, food, generally speaking, if you don't have enough money, you can't pay for the food. So we have this sort of uh, deprivation of uh, getting the food uh, that you want. He says that over time, um, in the past, he uses three examples, incest, cannibalism, and murder. In the past, society might have sort of not had not have that sort of deprivation of those things. So people did commit incest, people did commit murder, people did have cannibalism. But over time, uh, humanity or society has uh, created a stronger and stronger, more well-developed super ego uh, to uh, kind of prevent those things. And so now we add more things to the list of things that we're not willing to do that kind of benefits society. So if you remember in a previous video, I talked about id, ego, and super ego, and the super ego is kind of the same thing as, I guess, morality, all right? So he says that as society creates a better, better super ego, then society uh, has more people um, internalizing a good moral standard. And if more people in a society have a good moral standard, you have a society that can function really, really well. However, he says that even with a really good moral standard for a lot of people in the society, there's still going to be some people who are really greedy, who are really lustful, who are really aggressive, and they will stop at nothing uh, with deceit and fraud uh, to achieve their desires at the cost of society as a whole. And society as a result needs to restrict these people from doing that or else society is just going to collapse. And he says that a good society can be measured by how many people are have a good, strong superego and they uh, are able to internalize superego so they don't need to be coerced to do bad thing, uh, to do good things versus how much do we need to spend uh, coercing people to stop doing bad things and to do productive uh, labor for society. So there's balance. And if you have a really, really good society with really, really good superego, then that's really good for us. That's a great society versus another society with really bad, you know, people doing bad things, running amok and uh, murdering people and eating each other and whatever. So that's, that's what we want to try to avoid. Okay. He says that good societies will have a tendency to create two assets. All right. And the first asset is ideals and the second asset are art is artwork ideals are what you might think an ideal for society things to strive for that people should work towards and artwork is what do you think it is it's artwork things that we kind of look at to say oh that's really cool or, really good looking to express sort of a common experience or what art is i'm not going to get into the discussion about what art is in this video uh, 
but I hope we understand what that is. So what does he do next? He then criticized these two assets that a good society creates. So he says that ideals doesn't really work the way we think it works. It, it's not the situation where a society says, I want to achieve these ideals and then I'm gonna achieve them. And yes, good society. He says instead, uh, societies have a tendency to just do something and then whatever they do, that's their ideal. So an example would be, and he doesn't have an example, I'm creating this example, would be, let's say a society created in um, near the shore, near the water. They just happen to be there. They would have a tendency to understand the world through water um, metaphors and have ideals related to water metaphors and maybe even have uh, religious connotations with the water. They didn't previous, they didn't have, let's say, exist together and then say, okay, we have value water, therefore we'll walk to the water. They just kind of developed, they just happened to be near the water and then to develop morals and ideals and concepts and things for people to strive for based on the water. Another, I guess, more contemporary example I kind of would like to use is, let's say, sports teams. People who are really into sports, you're born in a state, and then there are sports teams there. And then your ideal is to kind of root for that sports team. So if you're in Texas, you root for their sports team, but you're unlikely to root for a sports team in Florida if you have no connection to Florida. So you didn't, like, wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to root for the best sports team. You just root for the sports team that's, that's already you've achieved uh, physically being next to the sports team. So that's his criticism about ideals. And he says that ideals are created to satisfy a narcissistic need for pride for a culture. And without this narcissistic need for pride, then culture wouldn't work. So the people who benefit from the culture the most, they will have those ideas, ideals that the culture already uh, accomplished, and they will promote those ideals. But for people who are suppressed, they will have a tendency to still identify with culture to say they're at least better than another culture. So the example he gives is that a culture with a set of ideal, ideals that it creates after the fact that they just did a bunch of things will then compare itself to another culture with a completely different set of ideals and then say, we're better than you. So the water culture may say, we love water, water is really great. And they will say the, the uh, um, uh, land culture, the forest culture, oh, yeah, we're better than them because we have more water than them. And, and that narcissistic pride is what keeps both the uh, people who benefit from society and the suppressed people in society to really promote that society, that culture. The second thing he talks about is art, all right? And he identifies that art can't be created by people who have to labor and work all day long. Art has to be created by people who have free time and have a lot of education. So by and large, the masses, the large group of people who are doing labor, they don't have the benefit of producing art. But what is the purpose of art? He says the purpose of art is to create a shared experience and to remind people of the ideals that he criticizes, keeps people suppressed. So that with ideals and art at the same time, people are then able to be suppressed, even if you know they or they have all these desires that they want to uh, do things and they want, let's say, more of what society has, but they just allow culture to suppress them. So then, what's the big takeaway for today? Well, what are we trying to get at here? There's a lot to take in, so maybe pause. Maybe you know we watch from the beginning. Uh, hopefully, it was at least clear enough uh, to understand the, the workings of Chapter Two for Freud. Um, I get the feeling that Freud is trying to answer this great question, how can a society exist when a large proportion of them or a, a significant group is suppressed, is taken advantage of? And we have that throughout history. We have slave laborers, we have slavery here, here and there, and they just were there and they just were unable to fight back. How is it that that was allowed? And then he goes into a discussion about art and ideals. He doesn't say that art and ideals are bad in and of themselves. Instead, it's that art, um, I'm sorry, ideals is bad because we kind of develop them after the fact. They're not actually ideals. They're not functioning as actual ideals. And that art is just a way for people to just point to those ideals so that everyone stays suppressed. That's his criticism. But the question I have for you is, and the big takeaway I have for you is, do you believe that's true? Do you see that as true? Are your ideals things that you develop for yourself, regardless of where you're from, regardless of how you grew up, or were they kind of created because of how you grew up, because of you know the circumstances around you? I guess an example is if you, you know, if your ideal is to study a lot, 
Is it because you said, oh, I should study a lot? Or is it because you were able to get good grades, let's say early on, and then you developed the ideal that studying a lot is a good thing, right? Or maybe the ideal of chores, right? You believe chores are a good thing. Is it because your parents and you grew up, that you grew up with chores, right? And therefore, because you did them, you have to have them as an ideal that it's a hardworking, you're a hardworking person for doing chores. Or is it that you grew up doing chores and to satisfy your narcissistic desire to think of yourself as a good person, you say, the ideals of chores is something everyone should have, right? That's uh, my little dinky uh, examples for that. But the goal of this isn't to say Freud is right or wrong. The, the goal I want to kind of emphasize is that in an effort to heal the, the, the damage between psychiatry and religion, I want to emphasize that the goal of understanding Freud, again, isn't to understand whether he's right or wrong, it's to see whether or not he resonates with reality. To the extent that Freud is correct, we want to see, is it true with my observations about society, with my observations of, of myself? If it is, okay, then we have to kind of understand what to do moving forward. Now, to the extent that he's wrong, our understanding of reality, our observation of reality, would give us a sense of where he's wrong, where he's kind of off. And so I want to ask you, is what I talked about true in your observations about society? Do we actually create ideals after the fact? Or is that completely he's talking out of his butt, right? Or is artwork only to point to those ideals so that we can all be suppressed? Is that, is that the case? So those are my takeaways for today. And next time in chapter three, he's going to go into a third asset that culture creates, which is religious ideas and its illusion. So be very, very excited because we get into the meat of his sort of, um, uh, uh, his way against uh, culture, his reasons against uh, religion. So if you like this video, do like and subscribe. Uh, do hit the notification button uh, if you uh, want to get those notifications. And I'll see you next time. Bye. That was really, really hard. I opened a really big can of worms. There's a big can of worms right now that's opened. I'm gonna go through with the full 10 chapters. It's gonna be tough. Bear with me. Thank you very much for bearing with me. This is gonna be so hard. Bear with me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you next time.